Why do we and other animals have brains? Not all species on our planet have brains, so if we want to know what the brain is for, let's think about why we evolved one. Now, you may reason that we have one to perceive the world or to think, and that's completely wrong. If you think about this question for any length of time, it's blindingly obvious why we have a brain. We have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movements. There is no other reason to have a brain. There can be no evolutionary advantage to laying down memories of childhood or perceiving the color of a rose if it doesn't affect the way you're going to move later in life. Now, for those who don't believe this argument, we have trees and grass on our planet without the brain, but the clinching evidence is this animal here, the humble sea squirt. Rudimentary animal, has a nervous system, swims around in the ocean in its juvenile life, and on some point in its life it implants on a rock, and the first thing it does in implanting on that rock, which it never leaves, is to digest its own brain and nervous system for food. <laughs> so once you don't need to move, you don't need the luxury of that brain. And this, is often, this animal is often taken as an analogy to what happens in universities when professors get tenure, but that's <laughs> a different issue. So I am a movement chauvinist. I believe movement is the most important function of the brain that anyone tell you that it's not true. Now, if movement is so important, how well are we doing understanding how the brain controls movement? And the answer is we're doing extremely poorly. It's a very hard problem. But we can look at how well we're doing by thinking about how well we're doing building machines which can do what humans can do. Think about the game of chess. How well are we doing determining what piece to move where? If we put Gary Kasparov here when he's not in jail against IBM's Deep Blue, well, the answer is IBM's Deep Blue will occasionally win. And I think if IBM's Deep Blue played probably anyone in this room, it would win every time. That problem is solved. What about the problem of picking up a chess piece, dexterously manipulating it, and putting it back down on the board? If we put a five-year-old's child's dexterity against the best robots of the day, the answer is very simple. The child wins easily. There's no competition at all. But let me show you cutting-edge robotics. Now, a lot of robotics is very impressive, but manipulation robotics is really still in the dark ages. So this is the end of a PhD project from one of the best robotic institutes, and the student has trained this robot to pour this water into a glass. It's a hard problem because the water sloshes about, but it can do it. But it doesn't do it with anything like the agility of a human. Now, if you want this robot to do a different task, that's another three-year PhD program. There is no... <laughs> no generalization at all from one task to another in robotics. Now, we can compare this to cutting-edge human performance. So what I'm going to show you is Emily Fox winning the world record for cup stacking. Now, the Americans in the audience will know all about cup stacking. It's a high school sport where you have 12 cups, you have to stack and unstack against the clock in a prescribed order. And this is her getting the world record in real time. And she's pretty happy. We have no idea what is going on inside her brain when she does that, and that's what we'd like to know. So in my group, what we try to do is reverse engineer how humans control movement. 